Good morning. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Okay, excellent. So what you should be seeing on your screen is I hope uh, the slides, and I've opened up the chat on the side there as well. So we'll work through this together. Can you see the slides okay? Yep. Okay, perfect, thank you. So we'll start here. Um, we're into module number 10, which is the criminal justice system. So we'll look at that today. Uh, and then uh, next week we're gonna be into restorative justice and then into the final review and then the final. So really we have just the two weeks left, two more topics, criminal justice system this week and restorative justice next week. So we're almost, we're nearing the end. So hold in there. Um, just a couple of quick notes. Uh, the midterm, again, my apologies for the error that you received. I've never received so many emails in 30 seconds of my life. So um, I'm working with IT on that. They're looking at it to see what caused that. And uh, so it doesn't happen for the final. So we'll work through that before the final. Uh, the midterm was really, really well done. Um, midterm number one, the class average was about 61. And on midterm number two, the class average was about 72, so about 11% higher, um, which is great. Um, that's, a, that's a really good average, so good, good for you. Um, if you did not score very well on the midterm and you would like to uh, go over some of the topics, um, please reach out to me and we can set up a private either Zoom conference or we can email uh, and clarify um, any topics you don't understand. I'll, I'm, I'd like to make sure you understand them before the final. So if you're one of those people, um, that did not score very well. Please get a hold of me and we will uh, work through that. Um, okay, we'll get into it here. So here's just an overview for where we're going to go this week with the criminal justice system. Uh, chapter 13 of your textbook. Um, we're going to look at some definitions of crime and offenses. We're going to look at crime measurement and some challenges with crime measurement. Um, we're going to look at three perspective models of criminal justice processing. And we're gonna discuss the three main institutions or components within the criminal justice system, uh, which are the police, the courts, and corrections. Um, as I noted, their police is obviously the law enforcement component, the courts are the judicial component, and corrections uh, deals with punishment and rehabilit rehabilitation. So we'll start off here with the definitions of crime. Uh, there's a number of different definitions of crime uh, that you can come up with. Um, a legal definition might look something like uh, an act um, which is in violation of any law. So that would just be a basic legal definition. A uh, behavioral definition of crime might be something along the lines of behavior that either uh, because of negligence or intention causes harm, which is crime. Uh, for our purpose, I put the definition up there, um, any act or omission regarded by a sizable segment of a given society that warrants formal intervention to control, punish, and prevent such behavior. And we're gonna talk more about the control, the punishment, and the prevention um, as some guidelines for sentencing. Um, the, uh, the act or omission in there, essentially, we've discussed this in class before, but remember, most crimes are an overt act. That's your actus reus, that's an act. In some cases, there's an omission of a behavior. One example of an omission would be criminal negligence causing uh, bodily harm, for instance. So if someone needed to do something and didn't. So an example would be, um, another example would be failing to provide the necessities of life to someone's children. So if they don't feed, clothe, shelter your children, that's an omission. So just so that that's clear, um, but usually it's an act, an overt act, a theft, for instance, someone actually goes out and steals something, that's an overt act. So uh, for the purposes of, of this class, any act or omission um, that is against the law. Um, from a theoretical perspective, I put up their structural functionalism, and essentially structural functionalists define criminal law as a system of rules developed collectively by legislatures uh, to protect all members of society equally. So I would argue, by and large, that's what our current criminal justice system looks like. It's a structural, functionalist perspective. Uh, another theory 
that your textbook discusses is conflict theory, which takes a bit of a more critical perspective of crime. Um, conflict theorists believe laws target behaviors of less powerful people while ignoring uh, more harmful behaviors committed by individuals with more economic power or institutions. Uh, I put a number of examples up there. We look at white collar crime versus blue collar crime, price fixing, and when large organizations commit criminal offenses, are they held to the same account um, as your everyday person? Some would argue they're not. Um, when I say white collar crime, I put the definition at the end of this lecture, but uh, when we discuss white collar crime, I'm just referring to generally uh, frauds um, or thefts of money, internal thefts uh, from businesses, that sort of thing, uh, computer frauds where people take uh, other people's money by fraudulent means. That's your white collar crime. It's not the assault, it's not the robbery. So just so we're clear on that. Uh, price fix fixing is a, another example where large corporations get together and fix prices um, to take extra money out of your pockets and mine. So is that viewed uh, in the same light as, as uh, other crimes? Conflict theorists would argue it's not. So just a few things to be aware of there. So social control. The criminal justice system is primarily concerned with social control. And I put just a quote up there, uh, social control includes customs, beliefs, and laws that frame society's norms, essentially what are and are not considered acceptable behaviors. Okay, and there's two types of social control, informal and formal. And th those aren't uh, too hard to define. Essentially, informal social controls are words and actions from people like your parents, your peers, your kids, um, friends, that sort of thing that influence our behavior. And informal social control helps organize society and encourages law-abiding behavior uh, for example, reducing harm caused to one another through violence, through theft. Um, generally, your friends and family will discourage you from doing those things, um, and that is an informal social control. Uh, formal, on the other hand, is based on the legal definition of crime and relies on leg legislatures to define the parameters in which the criminal justice system can operate. So that's your formal laws. That's not someone posting uh, on Facebook, hey, I think we should do this or that. That maybe is an informal social control. The formal side of it is the actual law that is legislated. Um, your textbook noted society is becoming more complex and anonymous. So essentially we're moving away from an everybody knows everybody sort of mentality to urban living. Um, and in these situations, some people don't even know their neighbors. So um, that's the direction society is going. Um, the relationship between informal and formal social control is an er inverse relationship. If informal controls are effective in controlling someone's behavior, less formal control is required. And the, the opposite is true. If they're ineffective, more formal social control would be required. So there is an inverse relationship there. Now we're going to get into the three types of offenses. We did touch on these already uh, in the lecture on law, but we'll just go over them again briefly as they do apply, obviously, to this module as well. So the three types, as you may have found on your uh, midterm there, indictable offenses. Um, so those are the more serious types of offenses. Your murder, theft over $5,000, break and enter, aggravated sexual assault. Those are very, very serious offenses. Um, Obviously, murder would be uh, the most serious. Theft over $5,000 is a bit of a unique um, charge, as it's not that common. Very rarely are people charged with theft over $5,000. Um, in cases where they are, um, it's usually a vehicle, which has a separate section in the criminal code. If, if someone steals a motor vehicle, that's a different section than theft over. One place you do see a lot of theft overs is internal thefts from businesses where maybe an employee has been uh, taking money for over a long period of time and that adds up to over 5,000. That's kind of a unique offense. Um, break and enter to a dwelling house, break and enter to a house is the only non-violent offense in the criminal code that I know of that carries a maximum sentence of life in prison. Um, not that anyone would be sentenced to that, but it is on the books. 
And then I noted aggravated sexual assault or aggravated assault as being an indictable offense. Remember, there's three levels of, of assault, level one, level two, and level three. Um, level one is just your common basic assault. Level two would be assault with a weapon or assault causing bodily harm. And then the third most is uh, aggravated. So an aggravated assault or an aggravated sexual assault is an assault that uh, disfigures someone. It's one step shy of attempted murder. So after aggravated assault would be attempted murder and then murder. So those are very serious charges. Those are your indictable offenses. Uh, your summary offenses are your much lower, uh, less uh, serious offenses, like causing a disturbance, uh, fraudulently ob obtaining food from a restaurant, someone doesn't pay their, their tab at a restaurant, uh, that sort of thing. Those are on the lower end. And then the hybrid offense, remember, are also referred to as dual offenses, and that's when the Crown decides how to proceed in court. So um, impaired driving, I put up there, assault is a dual offense, so uh, the Crown can elect to proceed by way of indictment, or the Crown can elect to proceed summarily uh, with a dual offense. So um, those, again, just a quick review on the three main types of offenses. Okay, we're gonna get into measuring crime. So one thing that a lot of stats people who work in the criminal justice system will be familiar with is the Uniform Crime Report, or the UCR. Um, it's an annual standardized collection of incidents that come to the attention of the police. So what does that mean? That's reported crime. Uh, and as you'll see, uh, as we move through this, this module, the overwhelming majority of crime is not reported to the police. So when you read in the newspaper or hear on the news, the crime rate is up, the crime rate is down. What that is actually telling you is the reported crime rate is up or the reported crime rate is down. Um, there's a bunch of studies on this. Uh, the one I usually refer to is states about 33% or so, 33% uh, of crime is actually reported to, to the police and the other two thirds is not. Some say it's closer to 50-50, but um, most people agree that more crime is not reported to the police than crime that is reported to the police. And there's a number of reasons for that, which we're gonna discuss. Something else to keep in mind as we look at this topic of measuring crime is the hierarchy rule. So although an incident may involve multiple offenses, uh, for statistical purposes, only the most serious crime is reported into the UCR. So if you have an offense where there's an armed robbery and then there is a uh, theft under $5,000, there's two offenses that occur, um, only the robbery is recorded. So um, this UCR does not capture all crime. In fact, it captures very little um, of reported crime. Um, there's different ways to measure crime. One is through victimize, victimization surveys, so just general surveys of victims, uh, victims of crime. Because remember, when, when there's an offense, when a criminal offense occurs, there's usually a victim associated to that. So we don't want to forget about the victims. So we do victimization surveys where victims can report crime that maybe they wouldn't otherwise report. And why would they not? report crime, a number of reasons I put up there. So subtle nature of a crime, uh, maybe they don't think it's that important. Um, another reason is the victim doesn't perceive the, uh, the offense as a crime. Uh, so the victim is unclear as to if a crime occurred or not. Uh, another reason offenders, a family member, friend, or an acquaintance. So if someone's brother steals their car, they might not want to phone the police because their brother is going to get arrested. So um, that is another reason why they, they may not. The victim believes it's a trivial incident or the penalty is too grave given the degree of harm done. So they don't want someone to get arrested um, and charged and go through the court process or they, they think it's just, it's not a big deal. I have my bike stolen, I don't care. Uh, that's another reason why crime might not be reported. Um, victim fear, fears for their safety. Um, so if the victim fears, if I call the police and tell them that so-and-so uh, beat me up, so-and-so is uh, going to come back after me. So maybe the victim fears for their safety. Um, victim doesn't trust the police. Maybe the victim is himself or herself a criminal. Um, and if they phone the police, 
Um, maybe they have some outstanding warrants or that they don't like calling the police for whatever reason. That's another, another reason. Um, one thing to note regarding uh, criminal offenses regarding drugs is the Good Samaritan law that exists in Saskatchewan. So um, always in the news right now is uh, drug overdoses due to fentanyl. And we have a Good Samaritan law because we don't want people afraid to phone the police if they themselves are using the drug. Just because there's drugs in the house, we don't want that to be a reason someone dies. So there's a Good Samaritan law where it states, say there's three or four people in a house and one person overdoses, um, another person can phone the police and not fear being charged with possessing fentanyl. And that's, that's there for this reason that we're discussing right now. The victim doesn't trust the police or they may get themselves into trouble. So we have this, this law. That law doesn't cover things like uh, more serious things. Like if there's, I don't know, um, a meth lab in the basement, well, that's, uh, that would be an example where the Good Samaritan law wouldn't cover the meth lab. You can't have a meth lab and then, and then call, um, call the police. Or maybe the victim is embarrassed. Uh, but for whatever reason, the victim is embarrassed by being the victim of a crime and they don't phone the police. They don't want the police involved. We're gonna talk about something here, uh, just a term, the dark figure of crime. So that's important to note. The dark figure of crime is crime that occurs, but is not reported. So it's not captured by the, the statistics. There is crime occurring, but, but it doesn't uh, get reported. That is the dark figure of crime. So in that example, where I said approximately one third of crime gets reported to the police and two thirds doesn't, that two thirds is the dark figure of crime. It's not reported to the police. Um, I put there, criminologists estimate crime is actually four or five times more than was reported to the police. That's from another study. Um, it's somewhere in there. The overwhelming majority of crime is not reported to the police. So um, just understand that that is the dark figure of crime. I also put a note there, some crimes are never talked about because they're taboo. So one example uh, discussed in the textbook was male survivors of the crime of incest. So um, that's, uh, that might play into not reporting the crime if someone's embarrassed. Then we move along into the criminal justice funnel. So there is a good write up in the textbook on the criminal justice funnel. And all, all that is is just what it sounds like. It's uh, essentially a, a visual of the actual number of crimes that are committed in Canada as they work their way through the criminal justice system, um, the actual number of incarcerated individuals in a federal penitentiary are very, very low. So less than 1% of people who commit an offense will end up in a federal prison. There's a number of reasons for this. So when we think about what we've already discussed, let's say an offense is committed, after that offense is committed, does the victim report it to the police? We know that about 67% of the time, they don't report it to the police. So that works into the, that reduces the number of, uh, the chance of a person being incarcerated if the crime's never reported right there. Um, if they do call the police, is the offense deemed to be a founded offense or an unfounded offense? In some cases, people think they're the victim of a crime, but they're not. And so if it's deemed to be an unfounded uh, call, that, that again will filter people through the, through the filter and out of the system. Um, does the case get set for a trial? If not, maybe something happens like pre-charge mediation, maybe they go through alternative measures before there even is a trial. And if they go through mediation, the Crown will usually stay the charge. So that's another reason why uh, people will not be incarcerated if the charge doesn't go to trial, and it's dealt with before. Uh, if the case does go to trial, is the person found guilty? If they're found not guilty, again, no chance of incarceration. And then even if they are found guilty, are they sentenced to a period of custody? Uh, and if they are sentenced to custody, do they actually end up going to, to jail? Or maybe there's an appeal launched and then the, the verdict is reversed. So there's just a whole handful of reasons why that funnel exists, why right? the actual number of crimes in Canada is far higher than the actual number of incarcerated individuals. Um, I just had a question there on the chat, what is incarceration? So to define incarceration, uh, I'm just talking about jail, uh, in custody. So someone is going, uh, if they're incarcerated, they're simply in jail. 
So thank you for that question. Okay, so we're gonna now move along to focusing on what actually, uh, what is measured, what does crime look like in Canada? So this is just some, some stats, uh, as you can see up there. So this is police reported crime rates from 1962 to 2014. And you can see the total number there is that light blue line at the top. And you can see it kind of peaked right around 1993, 1994, uh, and then started gradually coming back down. Uh, I know this is a bit of an old slide and it cuts off at 2014. So what would this look like if this was just extended out to today? After 2014, in about 2015, we saw right across Canada, the crime rate has actually uh, been increasing. So the reverse is true. It was coming down uh, until about 2014, between 1994 or so and 2014. And then in 2015, the crime rate has actually been steadily increasing. So that's just a graph there. And this is the crime severity index and the crime rate. So the crime severity index is something we haven't discussed yet. The crime severity index is simply another measurement of crime, but what it looks like is how severe crime is. And the way it does that is by looking at the potential jail sentence that would be associated with committing the crime. So um, that's simply all it is, just a measurement but it looks at how serious the crime uh, actually is. So if you have a high number of murders, um, that will drive your crime severity index. So I hope that is clear. I think someone might have their mic unmuted there. So here's uh, crime rates based on uh, people's ages. Um, and the textbook did a good job of talking about aging out of crime. So when we say someone ages out of crime, what does that mean? Um, we find that generally people in their teen years or adolescence, uh, the crime rate goes up, or they'll commit more crimes, rather, and then as people get older, they simply stop committing crimes. Very rarely do you see someone, um, you know, in their 60s or 70s doing armed robberies or, or things like that. It generally doesn't happen. Does it happen? Yes, it does happen. It's not the crime rate uh, for senior citizens is not zero. But generally, as people age, they commit less crime. So that's all aging out means. Uh, the textbook also discussed sentencing of adults versus youth. And when I say youth, I'm talking about people that are between the ages of 12 and 17. So when someone turns 18, they're considered an adult um, in the eyes of the criminal justice system, 18 and higher. If someone is under 12, they cannot be charged with a criminal offense in Canada. Um, if someone commits an offense when they're 11 years old, they cannot be criminally charged. So uh, that's an important thing to note. Um, youth, I'm talking about 12 year olds up to and including 17 year olds. And research suggests that someone's brain, everyone's brain actually develops uh, well into their 20s. Some say up until they're about 25 years old. Years old. So, um, Generally, youths are viewed as less capable of making sound decisions. Uh, and so in, in most cases, youths will not be sentenced as harshly as adults. And to discuss this, we look no further than the Youth Criminal Justice Act. Um, there's a whole range of things that are available to the Crown prosecutors to deal with youth crime that are not available um, to to adults. So for example, if a youth commits their first offense and it's not violent, usually they get some sort of warning. Um, and then if the, the offending continues, maybe it goes to a pre-charge mediation, that sort of thing, where they're maybe going to alternative measures and so on. So it's usually dealt with outside of a courtroom to begin with until some youths obviously have a, a long criminal record and then those, those cases will progress to an actual trial. Um, so that they're not, uh, not dealt with as harshly as a youth. Okay, just another chart just showing admissions to correctional facilities in Canada uh, by age. And as you can see, just a very basic chart, but um, the older people get, um, the less they're admitted to a correctional facility, which, which makes sense based on those other graphs that we looked at. 
this is an article there about uh, the decrease in Canada's crime rate that was released by uh, Safety Canada. And as we've already noted, that's no longer true. But if you want to see what brought down the crime rate a little bit, I'll have a little read. I'll leave that there for you. I'm not going to bring that up here. Uh, another measuring tool uh, used right here in the city of Regina, the Regina Police Service on their website actually has a crime map. And so you can see, uh, I'm not going to click it because I don't want to disrupt this Zoom session, but uh, on your own time after class here, I'll try and finish up a couple minutes early and just go back to this slide uh, that's posted on UR courses and just click on that link there, um, the top one, and essentially you can look at a crime map of the city of Regina. And this, the green part of the map is obviously where there's less crime, and then as the map gets hotter, uh, there's some red areas, yellow, and then into some red areas where crime is the highest in the city. So um, it's, pro it's, uh, it's right out there for everyone to see. Okay, so that will do it for uh, measuring crime. We're going to move into perspectives and models of criminal justice. So I noted three for us to consider today. Uh, the first one is the crime control model. The second one is the due process model. And the last one is the restorative justice model. And I noted on the slide that many scholars argue that Canada is a blend of all three of these models. But just something to be aware of. Uh, we're, when we're discussing the criminal justice system. So the first one we'll talk about here is the crime control model. Uh, and simply, the crime control model emphasizes control of dangerous offenders through quick arrests and convictions, as well as the protection of society through harsh punishment as a deterrent to crime. So essentially, the crime control model wants to see a lot of arrests and a harsh punishment as a deterrence to other people so they don't commit the same offense. It's a tough on crime uh, mentality and it, it believes it increases the efficiency uh, of the system. What we know is that most harsh punishments do not deter crime um, to the same extent that this, this model would, would have you believe. So um, be aware of the model, but generally, um, it's not, it's not accurate. Uh, one thing I note when it, it discusses, it wants quick arrests and uh, it views a high number of arrests as success, uh, successful. If someone is arrested, that means we have failed as a society to prevent the crime in the first place. So I would not view a high number of arrests as a success. I would view um, a high number of prevented crimes as a success. So just because arrest numbers go down doesn't mean we're not being successful. I would argue it means we're being very successful because through other means we're preventing the crime from occurring in the first place. So that's one criticism I have of this model is it doesn't address the fact that by doing good preventative policing, um, that is in fact a success, not necessarily the high arrest numbers. So um, just, be, just be aware of that. Um, I think that, uh, well, the last point there, rehabilitation is not the goal uh, of this model. So obviously rehabilitation should be the goal in, in all crimes. Um, I put up there the example of drugs in Canada, um, mm -hmm. but there, there's others for sure. Second one, uh, due process model emphasizes individual rights and constitutional safeguards against arbitrary or unfair judicial or administrative proceedings against a person. So it aims to deliver fair and equitable treatment, individual rights are preserved, and it limits discretion, which we're gonna discuss later in this lecture as well. Um, obviously, that's a very important, uh, one important aspect of this model is the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which we discussed already in this class. But there's that word again, due process model. It's very concerned with procedural justice. So that is the bullet points for, for the due process model. And the last one is the restorative justice model. We're gonna get into this much more on the last module of restorative justice, but just briefly here, the main goal of the criminal justice system, this model would argue, should be a systematic response to wrongdoings that emphasizes healing the wounds of victims, offenders, and communities that are caused by crime. So there's those three things again, victims, offenders, and community coming together to address crime and attempt to heal the wrongs that the crime 
um, has done. So um, the offender uh, accountability is really the central point of restorative justice. Holding that offender accountable, making sure the offender knows the harm he or she has caused by committing the crime. Punishment is not the goal of restorative justice. It emphasizes healing and reintegrating the offender into the community. So we're gonna get into that much more next week, but I just wanted you to be aware of that today. I'm gonna move right along here. We're, we're gonna discuss drug and alcohol use. So this should not be a surprise to anyone. There is a strong correlation between drug use and criminal offending. And the stats that were in your textbook are roughly 280% to 380%. Higher chance of a drug user committing a criminal offense over a non-drug user. So that is quite a difference. Uh, there's a strong correlation between the use of drugs and criminal offending. And there's a number of reasons for that, which I have on this slide. So from your textbook, there are three drug-related pathways to criminal involvement. Uh, the first one, the psychopharmological pathway. I say that 10 times fast. Psychopharmological pathway. That involves an individual ingesting a substance, a drug, and committing a crime because of the biological influence the drug has on the person's body. So essentially they're committing the crime because of the effects of the drug is all that is saying. Uh, the second one is the economic compulsive pathway. And this one discusses, uh, involves a person committing a crime in order to directly obtain drugs or to obtain money or property that can be used to purchase drugs. So We've discussed this a number of times in class. An example of that would simply be someone steals property and trades it for drugs, something along the lines of that. Um, that is what that one is discussing. And the last one is the systemic pathway. It involves participating in the illicit economy to get drugs to clients. So that might be something along the lines of a turf war or a drug, uh, drug territory, essentially a neighborhood maybe controlled by a certain gang that sells drugs. Um, this one, I don't think it's too much of a secret, but there are certain drug dealers that have, that have certain territories right here in the city of Regina. And what they will do is they will know who else is selling drugs in their territory and they'll go out and either shut them down, usually by violence, or they'll tax them. Um, they will charge them uh, money in exchange for selling drugs in their territory. So they're allowed to sell the drugs, but the, uh, I guess the higher uh, drug dealer will take a cut of that as a tax for operating in their territory. Uh, usually turf wars result in violence, uh, drive-by shootings, that sort of thing. That, uh, those examples are this uh, systemic pathway. Um, the first one, the psychopharmological pathway, I would view as kind of a not as common. Um, does somebody use drugs and go out and commit a crime because they're un under the influence and that's the only reason? Yes, absolutely does happen. But I would argue the second two on there would be your more common reasons. Um, drug use gets people involved in crime. Either someone is committing crime simply to feed their habits. Some, they're, they're stealing or they're stealing cars, uh, property to trade for money to buy drugs or they just straight up trade that property or car for drugs. And, and the other one there, as we talked about, is the turf war um, or the drug uh, territory. A um, couple other points just on drug use and, and the criminal justice system. It's important to look at the way drug trafficking is viewed by different countries. So is the way Canada views drug trafficking the same as the United States? Is that the same as other countries? Um, I would argue it's not the same. So. Um, there are heavy, heavy jail sentences handed out in the United States for trafficking in drugs. Um, they view that punishment model uh, as being the correct way to deal with, with uh, drug trafficking. We discussed in a previous class um, the uh, war on drugs uh, that the United States uh, launched and how that's a catastrophic failure. It did not reduce uh, drug trafficking in, in the United States. Um, we look at a country like the Philippines where people uh, can be killed by the state for trafficking drugs. Essentially, in the Philippines, there's, the law says that you can be subject to a firing squad um, and be put to death for trafficking drugs. That's an extreme example 
of uh, the way that country deals with drug trafficking. So just be aware of that. Drug trafficking is not viewed the same in, in, all, uh, in all countries, for sure. Okay, we're moving along good here. So let's just discuss a few goals of the criminal justice system. Um, really, uh, at the end of the day, the personnel that work in the criminal justice system, remember the police, the courts and corrections, um, their goal is to provide a formal social control, um, to control crime in a formal fashion. They don't concern themselves so much with the informal control that we discussed earlier. And the overarching goal of the criminal justice system is reducing crime. That is the absolute overarching goal of the criminal justice system, is to reduce crime using formal social control. I put the section of the criminal code in there, section 718 of the criminal code deals with sentencing provisions. Um, so one thing that that section discusses is the proportionate use of, use of punishment, rather. Um, does the punishment fit the crime? Um, another one is deterrence. So does crime pay? If someone sees person A committed, uh, say, a theft, and they were sentenced to uh, a large fine or maybe some imprisonment, does that deter person B from committing the crime? Just simply based on seeing what happened to person A. Um, does crime pay? The, the hope is that it doesn't. Uh, and the last point is incarceration should only be considered when it is necessary to ensure public safety. So. We've discussed this before in class and the war on drugs where they handled hefty jail sentences in the United States for the use of drugs. And does that prevent uh, an addict, uh, someone who's addicted to drugs from purchasing more drugs or using drugs uh, by locking them up? Um, I argue it doesn't. Um, is, is drug use a, a crime in itself? Some people would argue it's not. It's a mental health problem. Uh, that should be dealt with as a health problem. Someone has an addiction. Um, so there's a whole uh, uh, scale, I guess, if you want to call it that, of uh, dealing with, with uh, drug use. Um, and does a, a, someone who's simply using drugs pose a danger to society? Should they be incarcerated? Uh, and there's no easy answer to that, obviously. Um, someone simply using drugs, uh, beating themselves, drugs are obviously dangerous, and we're seeing that more and more every day, where fentanyl and carfentanyl, uh, which is just a, simply a, a much more powerful uh, opiate, uh, is being mixed in with other drugs. So someone thinks, for example, maybe they're using methamphetamine, or thinks they're using cocaine, when in fact they're using methamphetamine and fentanyl. Um, and some people knowingly use fentanyl. It's, this is fentanyl, and they're addicted to that. So does locking those people up, um, prevent uh, safety issues for, for the general public. I'm not sure it does uh, in some cases. In other cases, it might be appropriate. If someone is out uh, on an absolute terror stealing people's cars and their property and now these other people can't get to work because their cars have been stolen and it's out of control, maybe they do need to be locked up in certain situations. So there's not a one-off answer where we can say, this crime uh, warrants such and such a punishment. That's to be determined by lawyers and ultimately by a judge or a judge and a jury in a court of law after due process has occurred. So um, just for discussion, um, it, uh, I wish we could have a discussion, but <laughs> Zoom is not, uh, not good for that. But it is what it is because we're dealing with this health crisis. So we'll make the best of it here. So now we're gonna shift our focus to the structure and the components of the criminal justice system. And as I mentioned, there, there are three main components or institutions that make up the criminal justice system. And that's the police, the courts, and corrections. I just have a uh, example here. This is an American example, but it kind of shows, it's kind of hard to read unless you really get in there and look, but this is an American example of how the criminal justice system processes people, starting with the actual crime at the beginning on the left, and then working across to the right, um, the different ways the crime can be dealt with um, until it reaches its conclusion. So I'll let you look at that on your own here. So 
So the first component we'll talk about is the police. So essentially, the police investigate alleged criminal offenses. Um, they're responsible for apprehending suspected criminal offenders. Someone commits a crime, it is the police's responsibility to apprehend the suspect. Um, they assist in the prosecution of that person by obtaining, uh, with obtaining criminal convictions at a trial. So essentially, police officers will testify in court uh, against uh, someone who's charged with an offense. So uh, they're still the police, they're, they're not a member of the court, but they will go to court. Obviously, a police officer will testify as to what he or she did, what he or she saw, what the, uh, um, the suspect did, and so on. Um, keeping peace in the community is another responsibility. Uh, preventing crime, we discussed that already, crime prevention is key. Um, there's simply not enough police officers in the world to arrest everyone who commits a crime. So prevention is, is key. Um, providing social services on there. Um, child protection, obviously, is a major, major function of Canadian police officers and upholding constitutional protections. So um, the overwhelming majority of what police officers do in their day is not uh, arresting suspects. It's not, uh, you know, what you see on TV is, it's not just chasing cars, it's not just arresting people. A lot of paperwork, a lot of crime prevention, um, a lot of uh, social services, uh, child protection, that sort of thing. So it's, uh, I, don't, I don't like to use the words law enforcement and police as interchangeable. Um, law enforcement is one thing police do, but it's a very small uh, proportion. Of, of, it, it doesn't make up their, their whole day. Um, there's so many other things that go on. So sometimes on TV, you'll hear law enforcement did this, or law enforcement did that. Policing is much more than law enforcement. So that's one thing to note. So continue on here, uh, different types of police. So municipal, regional, provincial, federal, tribal, university, wildlife conservation. So what are all those? So municipal in Canada, generally speaking, most large cities have their own police service, the Regina Police Service, the Edmonton Police Service, Vancouver Police Service, Toronto Police Service, and so on. Um, that, those are your municipal police agencies. They're responsible for policing within each city. Now, in the case of Saskatchewan, all municipal police officers are sworn in as police officers in and for the province of Saskatchewan. So if someone commits an offense in Regina, and the police are chasing him, and he goes out to Moose Jaw, the Regina Police Service can still arrest that person in Moose Jaw. They still have police powers anywhere in the province of Saskatchewan. And there's a number of other, a small percentage of municipal police officers are actually sworn in uh, to investigate crimes at the federal level. I don't, I don't want to muddy the waters too much here, but if you think of crimes like drug trafficking, um, it might be important for a few members of the Regina Police Service to be maybe to be able to make an arrest in British Columbia, for instance, where a lot of drugs come from. Um, I don't think that's a big secret. So if uh, the police officer is only allowed to arrest in Saskatchewan, when you have interprovincial crime, obviously that, that would uh, get in the way of the investigation. So uh, there are a handful of municipal police officers that, that are sworn in federally. But for the purpose of this class, you just think about a municipal police officer, generally the overwhelming uh, majority of their duties are to enforce crimes in their municipality. So in general, for the purposes of this class, a municipal police officer will enforce the laws in their city. The Regina Police Service will enforce laws in Regina. The Saskatoon Police Service will enforce laws in Saskatoon. So that's the way to think about that. Regional, not very common in Saskatchewan, if at all. Um, lots of regional police services in Ontario. So you think about Peel Regional Police, uh, Durham, Ontario, Durham Regional Police. Um, the Toronto Airport is in Mississauga. Mississauga is policed by uh, Peel. So the Peel Regional Police Service is responsible for policing the Toronto Airport. It's not actually in Toronto. So um, there's an example of a regional police service, uh, quite common out in Ontario. Provincial police, um, in Ontario, you have the Ontario Provincial Police, 
they're responsible for enforcing laws um, that uh, occur in Ontario. Obviously, Quebec has their, their provincial police as well. Ontario and Quebec have their own provincial police. Um, just looking at the questions here. So one question here came up, what are the CN police that drive around? So that's a great question. That is another example uh, of a police service. Generally, you have the CN police and the CP police. They're hired uh, by the Canadian National Railway and the Canadian Pacific Railway. They will enforce laws that occur generally around rail yards. So you won't see uh, the CN police pulling over a car that's nowhere near um, railways, for instance. They, they primarily enforce laws uh, that revolve around rail yards. So that's a good question. Um, and then the next question, can I take a minute and explain the new pass-fail grading system the U of R has implemented? Short, yes, yes I can do that. I'm going to do that next class. So there'll be a bit more on that. I'm seeking a little bit of clarification on that. Um, and I don't want to give you the wrong information. So I will discuss that uh, next class for sure. Um, I hope that answers those questions. Uh, one more here. Uh, can I explain the difference between highway patrol and regular municipal police? Yes, absolutely. So let's, let's discuss that. So in the province of Saskatchewan, there, there are highway patrol members. Um, same thing exists in Alberta. So in Alberta, there are sheriffs that perform um, traffic enforcement on the highways. Um, so they'll, they'll enforce laws like uh, truckers, for instance, semi-trucks that um, are, are they within the proper weights? They'll enforce speed limits. Any, anything like that that occurs on the, uh, on the highways, they'll, they'll enforce that for sure. Um, now, that's not to be confused with the RCMP, who primarily provide rural policing services in most provinces. Now, we discussed Ontario and Quebec, obviously, have their own provincial police. Um, a good example... Uh, well, let me just, I don't want to get too far ahead, but the RCMP are Canada's federal police agency. Every member of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police is a federal police officer responsible and able to enforce laws across Canada. So uh, if they're in BC, you know, Manitoba, wherever, Ontario, they are sworn in federally. Um, a, a kind of a neat example here would be in the city of Ottawa. So Ottawa is our nation's capital, obviously. Uh, the city of Ottawa is policed by the Ottawa Police Service. Um, rural Ontario is policed by the Ontario Provincial Police. So the OPP are responsible for policing the rural areas around Ottawa. And then within Ottawa, if you've never been to Ottawa, downtown are, are federal uh, government buildings. And that is policed, those buildings are policed by the RCMP. Um, so that's an example of three police services working uh, within uh, a small area like that. That's not generally very common um, in Saskatchewan, for instance, where we have municipalities, uh, the Regina Police Service, the Saskatoon Police Service, the Moose Jaw Police Service, and then for the rural policing, the, the province of Saskatchewan has a contract with the RCMP to provide rural policing. So uh, I hope that's fairly clear. Um, there's the different levels. Municipal police are generally policing a city. The provincial police are generally policing the rural areas and the federal police in Canada's case is the RCMP and they're responsible for policing anywhere in Canada. Um, as I mentioned, most provinces have a contract with the RCMP to also provide rural policing uh, to communities that don't have their own police service, very small towns, uh, that sort of thing. An example would be um, in Saskatchewan, the town of, uh, let's say, Balgoni or White City, those municipalities are policed by the RCMP. Uh, there, there is no uh, city police or municipal police in those small towns. Um, in the United States, by contrast, they have a high number of police agencies working um, in different locations. So. They have the federal police in the United States, which would be your FBI. They have a whole bunch of different federal task forces. Um, the ATF, for instance, alcohol, tobacco, firearms. They have sheriffs. Uh, the sheriff's department usually polices the state. Uh, different, every small, I shouldn't say every small town, many small towns have their own police service. And within a given geographical area, there's multiple small 
smaller cities that all have their own municipal police service policing those areas. So it's not uncommon uh, when you see American police uh, working to have multiple municipalities uh, within a small area because they're just because uh, the city name changes, that means um, there's also a new police service. Um, a good example of that, if you've never been to Southern California, the Coachella Valley, uh, the area around Palm Springs, California, in Coachella Valley, there's essentially nine cities in a valley. Palm Springs would probably be the most well known, but at least for me, you never really know when you're leaving one city and entering another one. It's all one kind of long drawn out, the street names just change, and you'll see nine separate police services, municipal police services working in that one that one area. So that's kind of a neat example where um, every small city has their own police service. So I hope that is fairly clear. I see another question popping up here. Uh, will I be posting this video to YouTube? Uh, yes, I will be posting this video to YouTube. So it'll be available for you to review later as well. So I hope that's a fairly clear uh, explanation of the different types of police. Uh, from right from the municipal police services, like the Regina Police Service, to your regional police services, the ones, the examples I gave uh, were Peel Regional and Durham Regional in Ontario, um, provincial police services such as the OPP or the Ontario Provincial Police, uh, the federal police service in Canada, there's only one, that's the RCMP. Uh, sometimes universities and colleges have their own police service, that's very common in the United States. Uh, conservation officers uh, are included here. The term given to police officers in the criminal code is peace officers. So P-E-A-C-E, -E, if that's not coming across clear, peace officers. So uh, peace officers are a, a, a large grouping of, of individuals in the criminal code that include police officers, that include uh, conservation officers, and a number of other people that, that are able to enforce laws in the province of Saskatchewan. Um, so I, ho I hope that's fairly clear. Uh, typical criminal justice processes, I noted up there. Starting with the initial contact. So, and we'll discuss this more as we go on, but um, initial contact with the police. That police officer has a multitude of decisions to make upon the initial contact with a citizen. So discretion is absolutely uh, imperative at, at, at this stage. Um, every person who comes into contact with the police does not get arrested. In fact, the overwhelming majority of people do not get arrested. Uh, discretion is used. A very simple example of that would be speeding tickets. Someone is pulled over for speeding. Let's say they're on the ring road, the posted speed limit is 100, and that person's going 120. They're 20 kilometers over the speed limit, they get pulled over. That police officer has the discretion to either issue a ticket, which is a, uh, essentially a provincial charge, uh, with a fine or to issue a warning, you know what, you're going too fast, you need to slow down, the roads are icy, whatever, uh, and let that person go. That, that is true of uh, speeding tickets. In some cases, uh, criminal offenses, are not, people are not charged. Um, we give, uh, I've talked about this lots in the class, but domestic violence is one where there is no discretion. Um, the province of Saskatchewan has a domestic violence policy that stipulates that if there is any evidence of a domestic assault or any domestic violence, the police officer will make an arrest and will lay a charge. There's no discretion. Um, take it, flip that around to another example of an assault that's not domestic related. So let's talk about two friends are out and they get into an argument and a fight occurs and one person is assaulted. Um, that's not a domestic situation. Um, they both feel bad about it maybe, uh, they don't want police action, nothing like that. That's an example where maybe um, the police officer is able to use some discretion and not lay a, a charge. Um, remember, it's always the state, it's always the police that lay a charge in Canada, it's never a person. Person A cannot lay an assault charge against person B. Person A can call the police, the police attend, and based on the investigation, the police may or may not lay a charge. So initial contact and discretion is um, a very big topic. And again, that contributes to that criminal justice funnel, that funnel where not all offenses wind up in a period of incarceration. So um, 
noting that is, is important. Um, after the uh, unmuted remarks, there we go. Um, the after the initial contact, since when someone calls the police, the police show up, uh, an investigation is done. So essentially trying to determine what happened, uh, who did what, um, and, and that sort of thing. So sometimes investigations are quick, and sometimes investigations take place over months and months and months. I think someone just uh, check your mic there. So after an investigation is done, the police will determine, did a, first did an offense occur? And if the offense occurred, is an arrest going to be made? And sometimes that happens immediately. And sometimes, like I said, it takes a while for the investigation to unfold out. Let's unpack that a little bit. Let's look at the case of an assault. Uh, police are called, they show up, uh, someone's standing there with a baseball bat and there's another person on the ground and that person is hitting the person on the ground with a baseball bat. Very clearly, an assault with a weapon. Um, the investigation will unfold very quickly and absolutely an arrest is going to be made at that point. Um, that's an example of a very quick investigation, very uh, clean cut. Let's, look, let's flip that around and look at some of these very elaborate bank frauds and other uh, frauds where uh, very sophisticated groups of people are um, essentially uh, defrauding, stealing, if you will, money from, from other people and their elaborate, elaborate bank statements and they've made, maybe they've stolen someone's identity, they've gotten their hands on um, some documents that belong to someone else and they're able to set up bank accounts in that person's name, uh, get car loans in that person's name, register a whole bunch of things, very elaborate, uh, and that person, the victim, has no idea it's even happened. Uh, it's not uncommon for um, identity fraud to occur in today's day and age and someone will find out, hey, maybe I phone them, do you, do you know, do you have a credit card with this bank? Well, no, I don't, uh, but they do. Just the other person is, is racking up this credit card um, or car loans, cars registered in people's names. They don't even know they have the car because they've never seen it. Um, so these investigations can take months and months and months to really get in there and, and because remember that the people that are doing them have taken months and months to set up these elaborate schemes and that can't, uh, you can't reach a conclusion in a day when you're investigating those sorts of things. So lots of things are involved um, depending on uh, what elements and what's going on with the crime. So I, I, and one thing I wanna just add a caveat here, in the examples I'm giving, I'm never saying in all cases something will happen or in all cases something won't happen. I'm just giving some examples. This is by no means legal advice or anything like that. Uh, this is simply for a discussion piece. So you can just kind of understand a little bit about what goes on in these investigations. Uh, don't take this as uh, legal advice or, or saying it's an absolute. Absolutely, Steve said in case A, this person gets arrested or in case B, no one's gonna get arrested. That's not what we're doing here. So just make sure you note that, that's important. Um, after the arrest, the police will file criminal charges. So uh, let's, let's walk through this. Uh, from start to finish with an example, just so it's clear for everyone. So uh, let's take the example of um, auto theft. Let's, let's use that. Someone, uh, I wake up in the morning and my car is missing. So I phone the police and say, someone stole my car. And so they'll take a bunch of information from me, what make of car, color, uh, get the vehicle identification number, the VIN, which is just the serial number that's unique to every vehicle, collect a bunch of information like that, an investigation will unfold. Maybe there's some video surveillance. Maybe I have surveillance on my house um, and I can see the person who took my car. So maybe we have a suspect now. Uh, maybe some other things are present, such as uh, maybe it's a Chevrolet product and it's got OnStar. So we can track that vehicle using OnStar. Satellite uh, radio is another example. Um, so uh, maybe the police are able to track my car and they find my car being driven by the suspect, the person who stole my car. So they will then arrest that person for stealing my car and potential for possessing my car for sure and potentially stealing it and then will file charges in court. So once the charges are filed, that person is charged, 
uh, a court date will be set. It might be the same day or the next day, or the court date might be set for two weeks down the road or a month down the road where that person is going to appear in court. And uh, once they appear in court, they're going to enter a plea. So we're not, I don't want to jump too far ahead because we're going to cover that when we discuss the court system. But that's kind of a very simple example of working through uh, where the police become involved in a criminal investigation, from working from the initial contact into uh, the investigation, moving to uh, the investigation uh, indicates there will be an arrest made, making the arrest of the person or people, and then filing criminal charges against that person, which will then move that, uh, that whole process into court. So we'll discuss that when we discuss court. I, I put a note there, police operate in a very highly visible and political environment. So uh, specifically marked police cars, uniformed police officers uh, are very visible, uh, easy for the public to see this is a police car, um, this is a police officer based on the uniform. So um, of course there are parts of a police service that are not very visible. Uh, you talk about plain clothes or undercover operations, uh, unmarked police cars. Um, they, they don't look anything like a police car and you would never know they are a police car. So um, there's overt police operations and covert um, happening every day um, in, in most cities in, in Saskatchewan. I um, just want to check the questions here quickly. I think I've answered most of those. Yeah, I think that's it. So we're gonna just end there for today. Um, I am gonna post this to YouTube uh, for you to watch later again if you want. Uh, we'll pick this up again on Thursday during regular class time. And we're gonna start that lecture with uh, discussing the court system, which is the second component of the criminal justice system. Remember, we just covered the first component, which is the police. We're gonna move into covering the court system and then the correctional system. So those are the last two components uh, that we're gonna discuss. Um, again, your midterms, uh, very well done. I'm very, very proud of everyone that really stepped up and, and did a great job on, on the midterms. Uh, even with that little snafu where you're getting the errors, everyone, uh, a lot of really good answers on that midterm. So I'm very happy uh, to see that. Um, I hope everything is clear. If something isn't clear, again, please contact me either via email. Uh, I guess that would be the best way. And we can set up an, an email uh, exchange or we can uh, do this one-on-one -on -one in, in a private Zoom session. We can discuss different topics and that sort of thing. Um, next class, again, I will discuss the grading system from the university once I clarify one point on that. Uh, so that's clear to everyone. And uh, yeah, I think that uh, we'll leave it for there. So uh, it's about uh, 11.05. Go back just if you have time and just click on the uh, those links that I didn't click on there, the crime map in Regina. Uh, and just have a look. And you can actually see the different areas um, where crime is most prevalent in the city of Regina. Uh, one other note, uh, you should be getting an email. I, actually, I believe you got it yesterday uh, asking you uh, just for your course review. Uh, so if you have a few minutes, please do com complete that course review, okay? Uh, I appreciate your feedback very much. Um, again, thank you uh, for your time today. We'll chat with you again on Thursday during regular class time.